Good evening, good evening, and welcome to our midweek power hour here at Campus Stella Seventh day Adventist Church in the great city of Norfolk, Virginia. Come on, somebody. My name is Pastor Ishmael Wade, and I am so excited and delighted to be with you all tonight. Thank you all for joining us for our midweek worship, where we come together to be filled with the power of God through prayer, through praise, and through the presentation and preaching of his holy word. Uh, at this time, we just want you to just shout out where you're from. I see some of our friends have joined us all the way from the Windy City. Shot town stand up. It's so good to see you with us. And so as you come on and join us, please share the city and the state where you are joining us from so we can give you a special shout out and so we can know all of our friends and family all across the country and even the world. Now, we always ask to please like, share, and subscribe. Please like, share, and subscribe because we know that you will be blessed, but we also want to encourage you to be a blessing to someone else because we're going to have some awesome, awesome things that will be happening on this evening. But before we go any further, let us have a word of prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of your son, Jesus, Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise for you are worthy, dearly Father. And so, God, we we are grateful for your protection. We are grateful how you have guided us, Lord. As we look around in this world, there is so much heartache, so much uh, 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 evil, so much trouble. Yet, Lord, we have the reassurance that that we don't have to give in to the trouble, but we can put all of our trust in you. So, Father God, no matter where we are, are tonight, emotionally or even location wise, please, God, we are looking for a touch from you. So bless us, we pray. It's in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Once again, we just want to welcome everyone who has joined us, whether you are joining us via Zoom, YouTube or Facebook. We just thank you for me uh, joining with us tonight because we have something very special for you, very special for you. But before we get into our presentation, our special word for this evening, we just want to share a few announcements that are important and very pertinent to our community and to all who connect and stay connected with us here at Campus Stella. The first thing we want to let you all know is concerning our digital discipleship initiative. Yes, our digital discipleship initiative, where we are being intentional about making and, and, and growing disciples of Christ virtually. And there's two things within this first phase of digital discipleship. The first step of our first phase is to is for everyone to create a list of at least five of your friends. Hey, you can do 10, you can do 15, you can do 20, but make a list of at least five of your friends. That's your friends, relatives, acquaintances, and neighbors, people that you know and have a relationship with. And the second step is then to invite your friends to, to the camp, to all of our virtual offerings and, and events we're having here at Campus Stella. We want you to share. We want you to click over and let them know, hey, 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 I, we, we have something great going on. There is something that you need to listen to, something that you need to hear that will bless your soul. You need to invite them over and you as well as them need to like, share, follow, and subscribe to our social media platforms and our YouTube channel because God has called us to be fishers of people even in this digital age. The second thing we want to remind you of is that for our church members, for all the saints of Campus Stella, we have we are been in the uh, in the midst of completing our church mission survey, our church mission survey that has went out personally to all of the members through email and text and we are listening and hearing and getting um uh, 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 points of views from all of our members as we create and develop a mission statement and some other things that will be produced and be presented coming down the pipeline in order to take our church to the next level in building up the kingdom of God. So we have, we, we, if you have not completed that survey, please go ahead, complete it. Make sure you share it with others to encourage them if they have not completed it, to completed it. We want to make sure that this is not just for the older people, but this is for all demographics, our children, our teenagers, our young adults, our professionals, our young professionals, our those who are um, seasoned citizens and everyone in between. This is for everyone. Uh, so please go and complete 
your church mission survey. Uh, and, and please share it with other members just to make sure that they have it well, because we believe that God has something special for us here at Campus Stella right now in 2021 and beyond. And, 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 and we also want to let you all know that this Sabbath, April 3rd, is Holy Communion, our virtual communion service. We will have this Sabbath in the midst of this resurrection weekend. For the Bible declares that on Friday, Christ was crucified. He died. He was buried on Sabbath. He stayed in the grave all day. But early Sunday morning, come on, somebody. I, 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 I'm going to let you preach, uh, uh, Pastor Greg, but I just got to get this in early Sunday morning. We, we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Come on, somebody. You need to be shouting because, hey, I'm excited myself. Come on. And so we have something very special. We're going to have a wonderful, uh, exuberant, solemn, a uh, 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 celebratory communion service together, our first of the year, where we're just simply celebrating the work that Jesus has done for us. Amen. That he's continued to do for us in by interceding for us, and he promised to return again. So we're going to have a great time for our communion. Now, um, finally and lastly, um, just want to uh, let you all know, of course, um, on last Wednesday, we, we lifted up prayers for certain members um, because uh, of losses that were experienced on last week. Uh, we ask that you continue to lift up in prayer uh, 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 the family of Sister Liana Jones, um, the Nesbitt family, um, that you will continue to lift up uh, uh, the family of uh, one of our sisters who passed, Sister Brunson, Alcora Brunson, um, and continue to lift up in your prayers um, the family of Elder Michael Manns. Um, his, the, the family had the viewing today and on tomorrow afternoon at five o'clock p.m., uh, there will be a memorial service for him held at our church, Campus Stella Seventh-day Adventist Church, Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, now, um, just want to let you all know, as far as information, um, even though the memorial service, there is an in-person gathering um, for the memorial service. There is a limit to the attendance due to um, COVID restrictions on both the state level and also on the uh, our church's conference level. So um, those who are will be in, in attendance in person are family and special invited friends. OK, and but 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 all else um, who will like to show their support and will be showing their support will be doing so by watching um, virtually and those virtu and, and and the live stream for that service will be available both on our YouTube channel here and our Facebook page, as well as a special link that will be posted on our church's website, camp, uh, camposda.org, camposda.org. So please, um, let's continue to keep the, the families in your prayers. Um, let's continue to uh, lift up uh, the family of Elder Michael Mann um, as, as, as we uh, remember the legacy and the life of this giant of a, of a man of God. Um, so, so tomorrow, five o'clock PM, let's support the family and, 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 and continue to lift each other up during these difficult times. All right. And even still, if you have a special prayer request, let it be made known in the comment section so that we can pray for you and with you during our time of prayer of intercession. All right. Now, without further ado, we, we have part two of this powerful message by our featured speaker who goes by the name of Pastor Gregory Brooks, who is an awesome man of God. He's a powerful preacher, teacher. He's a wonderful and dedicated father and husband. And I'm glad and, 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 and can say honestly and openly, he is a wonderful brother and, fr and close friend of mine. Anytime I, we, we call each other, we talk, and we talk for hours, even days. Um, just sharing with one another, sharing with one another. But this is my brother from another mother uh, and, and definitely a brother in Christ. And he's going to bless us with part two of his series, Unraveling You. So after this special music and song to minister to your soul, the next voice you will hear is that of Pastor Gregory Brooks. May God bless you. Amen. i 
heard them sing, he paid the price and Jesus bore it all. I've heard them sing, I'm coming home and heed the master's call. I've heard them sing the modern songs and songs of long ago. But amazing grace, so sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. Amazing grace, so sweet the sound, oh how sweet is the sound, no sweeter song, sweeter song in this life be could be found. Heard about the Savior's blood, was just white, why just no, but amazing grace, so sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know. It was the song my mother sang in sweet and humble voice Like music from the world above, it made my soul rejoice Its soothing words and melodies let the rippling waters flow But amazing grace, so sweet the sound is the sweetest song I know Amazing grace, so sweet the sound Oh, how sweet is the sound Sweeter song, sweeter song In this life could be found Heard about the Savior's blood Washed as white, white as snow But amazing grace, so sweet the sound Is the sweetest song I know Amazing grace, so sweet the sound Oh, how sweet is the sound Sweeter song, sweeter song in this life could be found. Heard about the Savior's blood, white as white, with white as snow. But amazing grace, so sweet the song is the sweetest song I know. But amazing grace, so sweet the song is the sweetest song I know. But amazing grace, so sweet the song is the sweetest song I know. But amazing grace, so sweet. Amen. Amen. Amazing grace is the sweetest song and sound that I know. It is indeed a privilege to be back with you again tonight. Um, Doc Wade, Bishop Wade, uh, mentioned our relationship. And I'll say this again. One of the, 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 the kindest, uh, just sincere uh, person I know. And uh, indeed, it is my privilege to call him brother. Um, and so I, 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 I thank you again, Doc, for this opportunity to speak to the people uh, of, of God uh, on your behalf. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I want you to know, Campostella, you have a man of God, someone who truly, truly desires uh, to, to, to be uh, where God is. And, and that's, uh, I don't know about you, but that means and that says a lot for me. And so I'm so gl grateful and glad again to be here with you. Tonight, we're going to continue our series. We're going to continue our series, Unraveling You Part 2. Uh, it's the last one. Now, you know, uh, when 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 uh, Doc Wade came to me a, f a few months ago, weeks, whatever it is, ago, and asked me to preach, um, and he said, I want you to do the Enneagram series. And I said to myself, Doc, I did that series um, each Sabbath, one, one Enneagram or one personality type each Sabbath. And you want me to do that in how many weekends? He's like, yeah, two, 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 two. I was like, oh, okay. And for per my personality type, and I'm a type nine, um, that's one of the most difficult things that you can do because I tend to over explain. And so I'm teaching you something that you can all um, benefit from. See, if, if you know your blind spots, then it's important that you lean into someone who has that strength. Somebody say amen. And so I was able to uh, lean in every now and again to my wife. I thank my beautiful wife and my, my kids, but I thank my wife for being uh, my rock, um, uh, you know, on earth, because Jesus is my rock. <laughs> 
But I thank my wife, who is the type eight, who knows how to just say things and get it done. So I'm going to take a cue from her page tonight, and uh, we're going to get right into the word. If you will bow your heads with me, let us pray. Father God, we come to hear from you. Speak, Lord. Your people are listening. Amen. All right, so we are... Um, continuing and tonight uh we're looking at unraveling you and as i begin i want to state three quick points three quick points that you can see here on the screen one the first is this we all experience the various personality types but we only have one dominant type uh, the second thing is this it's very easy to go from a healthy personality to an unhealthy personality and vice versa so you may think oh yeah i'm, he I'm healthy and you can quickly go unless, number three, you have a constant surrender of your wound to God. All right, so we're going to get right in, right in. And we're looking at the three types, the three types of, of triads within um, the Enneagram. Uh, the first is that of... Um, the gut or the instinctive triad. This is the action triad. Uh, uh, the ego here, the ego defenses to cover the emotion of anger. The ego defenses to cover the emotion of anger. Uh, and, and there are three personality types that reside within this triad. It's the type one, the type nine, and the type eight. Now, when it comes to the type one and anger, they internalize mm, somebody. They internalize their anger. Uh, the type nine tend to dismiss or deny, I'm speaking to myself, their anger. And the type, the type eight, Oh, they're going to let you know when they're mad because they externalize their anger. The other triad that we're going to look at tonight as well is the feeling triad. And uh, this uh, is the, the, the feeling of the heart triad. And the ego here tends to cover shame. Uh, and, and when it comes to the three types, type two, three, and four that ex exist within this triad, um, the, 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 the type two, they internalize or control their, try to control shame. Mm. Uh, hopefully you guys have all done, by the way, the Enneagram to know your type so that as I'm uh, saying, saying things, if you can benefit from it, but also maybe you know someone as an Enneagram type and you can now empathize with them. And so here we go. Uh, the type two, they tend to internalize shame. The type three tend to dismiss or deny shame and the type four externalize shame. And now the, the, the final triad you see here is the, is the, is the thinking or the head triad. Uh, they, the ego here defenses to cover fear. So it, uh, understand that um, the type five in this triad tend to internalize or withdraw to cope with fear. Is that you? Uh, the type six, they tend to externalize or they look outside of themselves in order to cope with fear. Uh, the type seven, they tend to dismiss or in other words, they try to keep their minds preoccupied, busy, so they don't have to deal with or think about Fear. But what can we learn? Uh, what else can we learn about these different Enneagram types? We're going to start with type eight and you got to stay with me. Take your notes. Maybe you're going to have to watch this on a rerun because I'm going to go real quickly through this. All right. So we're looking at the type eight, the challenger, uh, the challenger and the protector. They're also known uh, as leaders. Uh, so when we look at the type eight, a few things that I want to bring out to your attention. If if I should give them a tagline, and this is just a Pastor Greg giving them a tagline, it, it would be injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Come on, somebody. See, they have a need to be against. They have a need. If you're a type eight, you have a need to be against. And when they're healthy, though, they best reflect God's might and power uh, a, a bible character that you should be able to identify with is samson and you can find his story in judges chapter 14 
Uh, but, but here we find that they have several strengths. See, a type A personality, they will stand up for the vulnerable, the marginalized, the weak. And they won't easily back down. No, sir, they won't. They show bravery even if they are petrified or terrified, rather, inside. It doesn't matter if it's a lion or the enemy, Ask Samson. See, they are going to fight for truth uh, and they're going to fight for justice. They're leaders. They're full of energy. They speak directly and honestly. They're going to tell you their minds. They're not going to mince words. Uh, they have a deep desire to be loved and to connect. And they, when they love, when a type 8 loves you, they love hard. Thank God for my wife, somebody. I am loved, deeply loved. And, and they seem, and some people will, will misinterpret that love or that protection in a, in a negative way. And they'll think that love, looking at the blind spots, uh, is them trying to control you when it's really not. Uh, see, the fact is, when we look at some of the other blind spots of the eight, is that they don't want to be seen as weak. No, I'm not going to be the one. I'm not going to be vulnerable. Nope, not me. Uh, they are competitive. They, they, they have trust issues. They only see things in black or white. They fear rejection. And they have a short fuse, especially if they're disrespected. Look at Samson. Got disrespected. And what did he do? That's right. And so they could also become preoccupied with revenge and ideas of betrayal. You do not want to cross a type eight. You don't want to make them mad because they don't easily forget and they will express it to you. And this is the thing about a type eight. They're just full of energy. So they could be talking and having a conversation. You're like, hey, why are you yelling? And they're like, yelling? I'm not yelling. But everything is just elevated with a type eight. They're just full of energy. Uh, the other thing that we want to see, so what does this result in? Unfortunately for type eights, uh, when unhealthy, they can be lonely. They can have a small circle because they have trust issues, because they have problems letting people in. They can probably end up with like five people. I remember Verizon had that five, high five, or that five, just five people within their circle uh, and that they keep close. Because the fact is, eights are highly misunderstood. People are intimidated by them. They see an eight and they walk in the other direction. So what's the answer? Uh, for an eight, it's important that you surrender control to God like Samson did. See, Samson didn't want to be vulnerable, but it was him putting himself or placing himself in the hands of a child where he was able to overcome. See, uh, they, as an eight, you may view vulnerability as a weakness, but understand that it is a strength. Understand the Bible says, when you are weak, then you are made strong. So how do you engage an eight within the church or within your circle or the community? Well, one thing you have to realize is that you got to put an eight to work. Uh, let them serve. They have the energy for it, but, but they best serve in protecting the vulnerable and the marginalized community in the church or, or around them. So involve them in community projects or you're know, watching out for children or, or other uh, marginalized or vulnerable population. But also, if, if you don't have a, a lie detector test, you can use an eight to kind of scope out if someone is telling the truth or not. See, they are very good at discerning the truth. So you can use them, pastor, uh, to, 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 to detect uh, those who are deceiving or, or, or trying to practice deceit. But also use them in, in areas of church security, right? Uh, especially in the church because they like to protect. Now we're moving next to our... The next, the next, the next um, uh, personality type is the type nine, the peacemaker and the mediator, the type nine. Their need is to avoid. They like to avoid mercy. I'm preaching to myself. 
Uh, see, when healthy, though, the tight nine best reflect God's patience and peace. Understand that these are just my ideas from my reading, right? But I believe that the tight nine best reflect God's patience and peace. And a perfect example of a tight nine is Abraham. And we could find the story of Abraham in Genesis 18. And, and I believe their motto is, can't we all just get along? You know, they, they, they just want the peace. The, their strengths are that they are negotiators. Uh, the Bible lets us know that Abraham has this conversation with God and he starts at 50 and negotiates all the way down to five uh, type nines. They're great counselors because they have the ability to see all sides of, of the story. And they are also a vehicle through whom people can be blessed. Think about Gandhi or even Abraham Lincoln. And, and if they use their voice, they have the ability to make the right action. But it's important for them to speak up. But they, they, they have a problem speaking up because of their blind spots. See, the tight nines, they like to avoid conflict. They want to appease everyone. Uh, but they also tend to over-explain. In the example before, Abraham is negotiating with God. A type 8 would be like, yo, God, can what if it's just five? They would just get right to the point, right? Um, but the, the type 9 can over-explain. They can become dependent on others to make a choice for them because they want to be seen as easygoing and approachable. And this really is a false sense of humility. They lack the courage to speak up and they share and share their opinion and they doubt whether their voice matters or not. Unfortunately, the result of this is that a type nine can be indecisive. They can be a passive aggressive. They can struggle with their identity, similar to a type two, which we'll get to. Uh, but the difference is that the nine loses their identity to get along, whereas a two gives, gives, up, gives up their identity because they don't value their own worth. Mm. Uh, the, the nine. So what is the answer for a nine? A nine has to learn to trust God to guide you through your conflicts whether it's internal or external. See, God has the answer just as he did for Abraham when he faced the external conflict surrounding Sarah and Hagar, and possibly even the internal conflict that he had to go through when he had to sacrifice his son Isaac. So how do you engage a type nine in the church? If you're talking to a nine or working with a nine, narrow the choices for them, please. Uh, don't ask them, what do you want to do? Because that's giving them too many options. Instead, give them two options or three options and let them choose. But also, when it comes to nine, utilize them as mediators. The fact is, if there's conflict within the church, a nine is able to uh, listen to individuals and allow them to feel heard. At least a healthy nine. Right. So all of these are, of course, if you're functioning healthy, meaning constant surrender to God. Uh, moving along, we are looking next at the Enneagram type one, the perfectionist and the, ref the, the reformer, the need to be perfect, the perfectionist and the, 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 the reformer, the need to be perfect when healthy. They best reflect God's goodness and righteousness. Amen, somebody. Uh, you, the, the Bible character that comes to mind is Paul. And you can even look at all his writings and you'll see this theme, this theme of uh, uh, where even his strengths uh, come out or come to play. But we I put here for you Philippians 3, 4 to 7. You can go and read that. But here we see that uh, in, uh, the, their tagline is, integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is looking mm. uh, you can count on a type one to do the right thing even when nobody is looking what are the, what are some of their other strengths they have a desire to do good and to strive for right they're ethical they're high in integrity they're detail oriented they're organized systematic and and, and orderly they're task oriented they can teach as well they're good at teaching others especially from their own mistakes and pitfalls uh, they're committed and conscientious. They stick to their declarations. 
uh, type nine, I mean, the type one, uh, they're bold and courageous. They're willing to sacrifice themselves for what is right. They can inspire change and, and the, the consideration to excellence. Uh, uh, another example of a type, uh, a, non, uh, a type one would be, um, the name just slipped me, <laughs> but it will come back. Praise God. But, but, um, Martin Luther, Martin Luther, the great reformer of the Christian uh, movement. He is also identified as type one, but, but the, the thing about as, as with everyone, we all have our blind spots. So what are some of the blind spots for the type one? See, they tend to compare and judge. They can be very rigid and inflexible. They're hard on themselves, hypercritical. And they set unrealistic expectation for others. If you're a type one, please give others some, some grace. Uh, but the other thing, blind spot, is that they fear their inadequacies. Um, you see, because they fear their inadequacies, uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that they will not participate in an event or in an activity that they will not be good at. If they can't be good at sports, they're not going to do it because they want to do it the right way. Right. Uh, but, but they also in their, in their unhealthy state, ones can persecute others, even the same way that Paul is. He thought he was doing the right thing, but he was persecuting. Right. And so we see that they can persecute even through criticism, through their words, through their actions. Uh, they strive for a perfection that is also unattainable in their own strength. They overburden themselves and they start doing the task of others because they give someone a task and then they say, oh, you're not doing it right. So they'll start taking that task on themselves. But this only leads to resentment and bitterness inside. And if you're someone not in an honest state, you'll probably find yourself, yourself um, experiencing a lot of uh, pains, whether in your back or pulling your hair, or you, you start you, because you're internalizing, your body is now reacting to that. So, what is the answer for type one? Uh, you got to learn to receive God's grace and in realizing that only He is perfect that you can't do everything realizing that god can use your faults and your mistakes and you don't always have to get it right amen somebody somebody uh, see god's grace is sufficient so the question is how do you engage a type one in the church understand as we mentioned they're great leaders and they're also pastor great tithers because they believe it's the right thing to do amen but they're good at teaching morality and what is good. They're effective planners. So if you have programs that you need planning on, involve a type one. They're good to have on projects, on building committees because of their detail-oriented nature and wanting to do things the right way the first time. They're good in administration, as administrative positions as well, such as clerks, uh, because they like to keep organized. And, and as members... Uh, you need to, and, and members, members in the church, uh, the, 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 my, I'm beckoning that you give them grace when they mess up. Understand that no one is more critical on themselves than a type one when they make a mistake. So you don't need to rub it in. So give them some grace. We're moving on now to the, oh, oh here it is perfection result moving on to the type two the type two the helper and the giver their need is is a desire to be needed they need to be needed see when they're healthy they best reflect god's heart of compassion and love the bible character that uh you can see if you read his books you see it all throughout the word love john that's right john the disciple is a type two and, and it's it's known that there is not a lot of men that's actually a type two there's actually more women than men but i thought it interesting i gotta put john in there but mary uh jesus's mom most likely looking at the, the context of what we see in scripture is also most likely a type two uh, and, and their motto is a life not lived for others is not a life. That's their tagline. A life not lived for others is not a life. Their strengths is that they can share generously. They serve well. They can befriend any 
one. If you look at John, you will see uh, that he knew everyone. Even when Jesus was in, in trial in the court and Peter denied Jesus, I, I mean, yeah, they were calling Peter out. John was there, but he was cool with everybody because that's because the two is uh, connected and sociable. They know how to cry with you and to empathize with you. They feel your pain. They can stand with you in your suffering. They're great cheerleaders and uh, supporters. They're keen on details of your life. Uh, my sister is a type two, and I'm telling you, she has a, a great mind to remember birthdays, anniversaries. It doesn't matter the events. She'll remember your name, their location. She met you. Type twos, they care about the details of your life. They can see gray, and type twos are known to adopt you as their own. Uh, what did Jesus say on the cross? John, behold your, 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 your mother and woman, behold your son. They know how to adopt people in as their own. Uh, but they also, like everyone else, have blind spots. See, depending on all, they depend on others to bolster their self-worth. They live to hear the words, I need you. They defer their own needs because they believe they're loved when they are uh, tender and understanding and useful. Uh, and so it can uh, grow within them a, a, a sort of pride, not the, the, the pride of conceit, but the one of, you know, I can save you since I'm more loving and sensitive than others. But they also have a hard time setting boundaries and saying no. And so type twos can overcommit themselves. Uh, what is the result of that? Well, the result is that they can end up in identity crisis. So they can believe that they don't, oh, they can also believe that they don't need God because they are loving and energetic all by themselves, particularly when unhealthy here. They also believe in a tit for tat world. I do this for you, then yo, you need to do this for me, right? But they won't say that, but that's the expectation. And it could come off then as being manipulative because they're going to keep receipts. They're going to keep receipts. They're going to keep track uh, uh, of what they do for you. Uh, but they also uh, can, 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 it can also result in codependence. It can also in, it result in uh, unhealthy too, that is, in the loss of their personhood or their identity. See, since, especially if they lose a loved one or someone that's close to them and they poured into that person, that person dying is as though they themselves have died or lost a piece of them. For this reason, type twos also hate being alone. They don't like being alone in their thoughts or in their feelings. They struggle with knowing who they are when they're unhealthy. So what's the answer? The answer for the type two is alone time with God at the foot of the cross. Amen, somebody. See, it was at the cross that we had all these type twos at the feet of Jesus, and they realized their, their need for God. They realized that they can't outgive God, and they also realized that giving doesn't start with you, but flows through you. How do we engage a type two in the church? Uh, you can use them on your social committees. You can use them in the hospitality department, especially to celebrate life's precious moments. You can use them in community service. Uh, you can have them in your amen corner. Amen, somebody. Uh, you can have them as your event cheerleaders. Uh, uh, two are great supporters. Uh, moving on, we're looking here at the type three, the type three. Three, the performer and achiever. I know I'm going through this uh, quickly, but hopefully you're still with me. If you're still with me and you're following, say amen, somebody. So we're looking at the achiever and the performer. And when healthy, they best reflect, uh, let's, let's, let's update this. They best reflect uh, a God's determination and drive. They have a need to succeed. Uh, the, the character in the Bible that we can look to or look at for an example is Jacob. Uh, Jacob. Uh, uh, and, and, and the tagline is, don't be the same, 
be better. Don't be the same, be better. See, their strength, the strength of a type three is that they're optimistic. They accomplish what others feel could be impossible. They're self-affirming. They're energetic like a type eight. Uh, um, they, they also don't give up easily. They're efficient. They're goal-oriented. They're industrious. They're ambitious. They're charismatic. They're great at recognizing what people like, admire, and want. They can recognize potential in others more than other, more, uh, and, and build those individuals up. But like, again, everyone, we, they have their blind spots because they can be work workaholics. They have a fear of failing. And so they're going to keep going, keep pushing. They are attention seekers because they, because of the fear of being ordinary. They overperform in order to be uh, of notice and love. They're overly competitive. They are status conscious and highly driven for advancement. And unfortunately, they will even resort to deceit if necessary in order to win. They can be self-promoting. They may even cause harm and damage to others in the process because they are out of touch with their own emotions and, and the feelings of others. So what is the result? What, is, what can this lead to? Of course, again, it can lead to injury and harm uh, with those around them. Uh, you know, I remember hearing this example of, you know, a type three could get married to someone and the type three will be in the wedding car. You know, the car that's parked out in front of the church, they'll be in the car driving away. And the person they are married to is almost like the tin cans at the back of that car because they can damage without even realizing it because the goal becomes more important. See, the result is uh, 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 one where the product is more important than the person. Mm. The role is more important than the relationship. And the image is more important than the individual. And so the focus can become one of performing over being present. So what is the answer? They need to accept that it's okay to lose. It is okay to fail, particularly if you're failing in the hands of Jesus. See, uh, with God, what may seem like the biggest failure, such as Christ's death on the cross, uh, was actually the greatest win for humanity. See, they need to have time alone with God and themselves with no public feedback or admiration. How do you engage a type three? Love threes for who they are. Ensure that you're, the, that you're messaging to them that being ordinary is actually okay. Uh, allow them to be the great leaders that they can be, and, 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 and especially in, in, in recognizing people's talents, gifts, and putting those individuals to, 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 to not work, but to, to action within the church. Let them run projects in the church, but let them know that you appreciate them for who they are, not what they do. Uh, we're moving on. We're, we're almost uh, to, the, uh, to the end here. Uh, we're, we're a little bit half above halfway. We're looking next to the type four, the last uh, type in the, in the feeling triad, the artist and the individualist. So the type four, when healthy, best reflect God's creativity and uniqueness. There is no other God like him. Does that phrase sound familiar? See, they have a need to be special. Uh, examples of type four in the Bible uh, would be David uh, you, uh, and, and Saul. The Bible says that the, uh, Saul had a different spirit within him. Uh, see, they, their strength is that they value differences. They, they like type threes. They can recognize the gifts and strengths of others. They can uh, dwell in pain and darkness. Oh, come on. Uh, I see a type three. They know how to, I mean, sorry, type four, know how to dwell in pain and darkness and create beauty and art from it. Amen for the fours. They're health conscious in the, in, in the sense that they, many of them are vegetarians and are animal right activists. Uh, they all, again, like all of us, have blind spots that need to be surrendered to God. 
See, they have a hard time recognizing their own gifts, uh, that the, the, they're unique, and, and, and they are long, they have the desire to long for something more than having something. So once they actually obtain something, it sort of leaves them disappointed. And, and what does this result in? Cons consistent envy. You're never going to be satisfied with what you have because you get it, but then you get disappointed and you want what someone else has. The Bible says uh, Saul grew angry with David slew. We hear David slew his ten thousands and or Saul his thousand and David his ten thousands, right? Uh, envy. But they also can struggle with maintaining relationships. And we saw that uh, if you look at David and Saul had real hard times maintaining relationships. So what is the answer? What is the answer? The answer is to accept your uniqueness in God. Appreciate what you have and who you are and how, and how God created you to be creative and to be a blessing to the rest of humanity. Don't envy others. Submit your uniqueness to God. How do you engage a four in the church? Make them, uh, you know, advocate for them to be designers uh, or, you know, design the platform for a sermon uh, illustration or topic or allow them to be a part of the creative uh, services uh, team within the church. Allow them to express themselves through art, music, plays, stage design, whatever it, the case may be. Understand that a type four, they have a great sense of litur liturgy, ritual, and shaping space. So use them for that. Uh, coming now to the last three Enneagram types. We're coming down to the last three types. We're looking here at the type five, the investigator and the observer. The Bible, I mean, sorry, uh, move on here. The t their tagline is, I am a very private person. You don't ask, I won't tell, or I don't tell. Uh, see, for them, they best reflect God's wisdom and depth. Uh, they have the need to perceive. Uh, a Bible character that you can go and read on that you could probably identify with would be Nicodemus. Uh, strengths of a type five. Um, the type five, they're great researchers. They uh, test things for themselves. They don't simply believe every uh, wind of truth. They ain't going to follow fake news and all these conspiracy theories. No, uh, if you really want to know what is really going on today, give praise for fives because they're going to they're going to get to the bottom of what is. Uh, they are deep insight. Uh, they're deep thinkers. They're truth seekers. Great listeners. Logical thinkers uh, understand that G when Nicodemus approached Jesus, he said, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher for no one could perform these signs uh, uh, you do unless God were with them. Or the disciple Thomas who said, hey, I ain't going to believe unless I see the nail prints. Come on, somebody, give me those nail prints in those hands. See, they're evidence focused and objective. Uh, but they also have blind spots. They're likely to consume more than they give. Uh, some people would say they, uh, they, they are also independent. They can be self-preserving to a fault. And they have difficulty expressing their feelings because they would rather make sense of it. You could be in the delivery room with your wife. And instead of experiencing the happiness, you will experience, from, experience it from a moment in your heart and then immediately go to your head and say, what's going on here? This is a, a, a blind spot. But the, 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 the result, so what is the result of these blind spots? For the type nine, they can be very stingy. Uh, they can uh, be stingy with their knowledge, possessions, their time, their emotions, and resources. You may know a five. Uh, uh, don't, 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 don't be hard on them. Understand it's a part of their, their, their desire to preserve and to, to have um, you know, security. Uh, they prefer to hold on to things that they acquire. and They compartmentalize their lives. A, a, a type five will have a lot of different groups of friends and, and you would even know it. 
When if you go to a type five's funeral, you be like, whoa, he knew this person. Oh, he did this. He did that. They're very compartmentalized. Uh, but this is again the thing they they can miss the moment. They can be so involved in trying to understand things logically, make sense of stuff that they miss the experience. So what is the answer? The answer for the type five is to help them move from their head to their heart. A willingness to for them to experience God in their hearts rather than trying to analyze God. How do you engage them in the church? You can use them. I, I've seen a few type fives, at least I believe they are on, on Facebook, church historians. Uh, they're good at looking back in the history of the church and d telling you details. If a, if a type five tells you it, trust me, you can believe it and take it to the bank uh, because they will get to the facts. Um, type fives are great listeners, so you can use them in the church as like a type nine in the counseling fashion or as a, or a mediator uh, or, or if you need self examination and introspection they're really good at probing and understanding and, and and really helping to give you a sense of who you are what's going on uh, but if you're working with a five as well don't engage them by saying you know i know god exists because i feel they struggle with that so immediately they're going to be like okay you know what that's enough uh, if you're preaching if you're talking to a type five uh, uh come with them or point to the book of nature understand that there are two books y'all there's the book uh, of the bible there's a the book of nature uh talk about how god reveals himself through that uh through science because uh, that's a, a really effective way to connect with them and their logical mindset uh moving on to our second to last um enneagram the type six the type six the loyalist and the skeptic a more, uh, they're actually more of this type in the world than any other. Uh, that's right. We have more doubters in the world than any other personality type. They have a desire for security and certainty. See, when they're healthy, they best reflect God's loyalty and faithfulness. Amen. We look at the Bible character, Gideon, in Judges 6 to, to, to 8. Uh, their motto would be, always have an escape plan. Uh, they're the great Houdinis, man. They're the, they're, they're the ones who know how to escape. Uh, but again, more of their strengths. They're excellent troubleshooters. They're very exploratory. exploratory. Uh, they're extremely dependable. They will be there with you through the thick and thin. They're responsible. They're great followers once they push past their fears and doubts. Very loyal. They're open-minded since they tend to think about all the different possibilities. They're great planners. If you are in a plane that's about to grow, go down, God forbid, uh, find a, a, type, a type six because I'm sure they've thought about how they're going to get out, how they're going to save themselves. But no, seriously, uh, they, they are really effective of, at understanding situations and finding answers, or at least all the different variables that are out there. Uh, their blind spots, though, is that they can tend to focus on their inadequacies. They like to play devil's advocate since they have a hard time trusting people and others. So like a type eight, they will probe and try to understand, though they may not as be as intimidating or as forceful as an eight. They can overthink. They can overanalyze. What is the, what is the result? They're highly doubtful. Uh, they live in, in fear. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me... I've been preaching. I'm so excited. I'm missing the slides here. <laughs> but but what is the, the, the result? They're highly doubtful. They live in fear and anxiety. They're, they can be negative, emotional, and they're not able to stay in the present, but they're always focused on the future. And so what is the answer for the type six? They need to trust and surrender to God who is truly, as the Hebrew says, hesed, faithful. See, if, if, if Jesus can surrender, then certainly they can as well. See, God has control of the future. And though you can't see it, God sees the future. Amen, types, type six. God sees the future. So place your anxiety at the feet of Jesus. The Bible says, cast all your cares upon him because he takes care of you. It says, don't worry about anything, but in everything, make your request known to God. 
How do you engage a type six? Well, have them on the building project or the community service team where they can consider all the various options. You can use them as deaconesses or deacons in the church who will be faithful and loyal in service, but also thoughtful about things that need to be uh, taken care of or, uh, or at least looking at all the different situations that could happen around the church. You can even have them as a risk management or part of a risk management team in the church. And finally, uh, thank you for staying with me. I didn't think we would make it this far, but finally we are here, the type seven, the type seven, the enthusiast, the enthusiast and the adventurer. Uh, the enthusiast and the adventurer, they have a need to avoid pain. Oh, yes, sir. That's right. They don't like pain. My daughter is a type seven, y'all. And I'm telling you, that's true. They don't like pain. Uh, but when healthy, they best reflect God's joy and God's hope. Uh, uh, an example of a seven in the Bible, I would say, would be Solomon. And you can read all of uh, the texts uh, on a seven in, in, in Ecclesiastics. Their motto is, over planning kills magic. Why is that? Because type sevens are risk takers. That's right. They're optimistic. They're enthusiastic. They're, they're extremely practical. They're infectious with a sense of humor. They know how to turn pain into comedy. A lot of comedians out there are type sevens because they, 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 they reframe or recast their, their pain of their experience into comedy, but they're not afraid to ask tough or difficult questions. I, 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 I remember watching, observing a type seven, ask someone a question that I was like, how do you ask that? But a type seven is not afraid to ask tough questions. They're risk they're dare, they're dare, dare, they're daredevils. Uh, they're spontaneous, they're widely read, and they're highly verbal. They're endowed with quick, agile minds, and they can be exceptionally fast learners, very, very sharp and astute. But they again, like every one of us, we they have blind spots. They have blind spots. See, they don't have a filter. As I mentioned before, whatever comes to their mind, they're, they're, they're probably going to say it 99% of the time. Uh, of course, it went on healthy. Um, but even when healthy, <laughs> they'll still say it. But, but also, uh, other blind spots, they may be seen as outspoken, vulgar, ill-mannered, or outrageous. And so they also try to keep busy at times to avoid anxiety and to avoid pain. And they're always on a quest for more stimulation. And that quest for more stimulation actually has, uh, it, it, you know, it's, 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 it's result or it's the negative result of, you know, um, not, not appreciating like almost like the, the, the type four, not appreciating what you have. I uh, see they, the, the type seven, they're like Peter Pan. They never want to grow up. They want to live in adventure. They want to, they don't want to feel pain. They just want to have fun in life. And, and they're always more than anyone else. They suffer from FOMO, the fear of missing out, man. If I commit to this, what about this other thing that may happen? So if you actually have a party and, like, and you talk to them and say, Hey, I have a party. They'll probably say something like, yeah, yeah. I, 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 um, let me see what's on my calendar and I'll get back to you. In other words, if something else doesn't come up, that's more fun, then they can say, okay, I'll be there. So they always give themselves that out. So they don't have to be tied down. Mercy somebody. Uh, but, but you know, this, the result is that they, they, they live for the shock factor. You never know what you're going to get with them. Um, they practice the trial and error method. Let's just get it done. Let's just try it and let's see what happens. Uh, maybe this is why Solomon was able to pen in Ecclesiastic 1.9. Solomon, uh, who pretty much experienced so much, right? There is nothing new under the sun or all is vanity. See, he tried it all. They, they live for the next adventure. As such, sevens get so excited about expecting, they miss experiencing. Hear me if you're a seven. They're so caught up in anticipating that they miss actualizing. So what is the answer? 
What is the answer? The answer is that you've got to stop and smell the roses. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 18. As members, you've got to help them stop, slow down, sip some tea, take time to notice what they're overlooking. Realize that while the world can get boring, this is important. See, while the world can get boring, come on someone, there is always a new adventure with Jesus. If you want an adventure, just hold on to Jesus. He will give you the thrill that you seek. How do you uh, engage a seven in the church? Allow them to plan all the fun activities. (laughs) They want to do it anyway. Right. But anything that also involves risk, uh, you know, risk takers, they're great entrepreneurs, by the way. So get them involved in, in, in things where you know that you can pull out those strengths uh, to help you. All right. So I know that was a lot, but we made it through. Uh, and we're at the end. And I want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with this. See, um, don't miss this. Don't miss this. And this is for all personality types, all personality types. Hear me. Don't miss this. The pain you push away prevents the pleasure that could be produced. Mm. I'm going to preach to myself. The pain you push away could prevent the pleasure that could be produced. What are you trying to say, Pastor Greg? Understand that it is the pain that you are running from, the hurt that you are running from that produces the pleasure you are pursuing. Oh, let me break it all down. In other words, if you don't embrace your pain and hurt and give it to God, you will never experience the joy that can come from it. You've got to surrender your wounds to Jesus. Uh, This reminds me of a phrase that I heard in chaplaincy while I was learning about the Enneagram and going through this. It says it's important to birth your story. See, a lot of us like to run away from our wounds, but you've got to embrace your wounds. Uh, You know, uh, I remember when my wife was in labor. I'm talking about embracing your pain. Uh, She's hurting. She's in pain. And the fact is, no one knows how long the pain is going to last except her. I remember being there beside my wife for all three kids. I held her hand. I rubbed her feet. I massaged her back. I fed her ice chips, somebody. But I could not share her pain. Mm, I'm going somewhere. See, my actions did not remove the pain. My wife still had to embrace the pain. Uh, It was part of the birthing process. She had to endure the pain. But once that baby, somebody say amen. Once that baby came out, her pain turn to joy. Ah, see, from her great pain, she gave birth to the pride of her pleasure. Understand that the magnitude of your pain determines the measure of your gain. I'm going to say that again. The magnitude of your pain determines the uh, measure of your gain. The depths of your sorrow reveal the height of your joy. And the weight of sin reveals the power of God's grace. Uh, The Bible declares where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And so today, God is offering every single one of us, no matter your personality type, he's offering every single one of us his grace, marvelous grace, his sufficient grace. Uh, However, uh, some of you are running from that pain. You're running from that wound. Uh, You're running and masking it with your personalities. Well, today God is inviting you to unravel yourself. The question is, what will your answer be? 
Who are you? I join you or encourage you to begin the journey of unraveling yourself and finding a greater image of God and a greater purpose for your life by discovering who you are. May God bless you. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the reminder that we are nothing without you. The reminder that our pain is part of our purpose, that our pain is part of our joy, our pain produces growth. So Father God, you know the hearts, you know the hearers and the audience, you know what they're going through, you know the personality types, you know the vision for uh, Campus Stella, you know the hurt God. And everybody is trying to look uh, at others without understanding truly who they are themselves. And so because of that, they're not able to receive your grace or even offer it to others. But in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will break those chains that bind them. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you will set that church free. I pray, God, that they will go out to do your work and to finish this uh, uh, work in the gospel so that when you come, we can all look up and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he has saved us. So, Father God, help us to journey on the path to unraveling ourselves with you. In Jesus' name I pray, let everyone say or type, amen, amen, and amen. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, just, just go ahead and, and show some sign right now. Have you been blessed? Amen. I, I said, have you been blessed? Go ahead and hit the heart, the like buttons, put it in the chat. Wow, what a powerful, wonderful, insightful, and, 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 and needful word and instruction. Thank you so much, Pastor Brooks, um, for, that, for taking us through this powerful and poignant series, Unraveling You, helping us to understand the importance and need of knowing who we are in Christ and seeing the, the gifts, the skills, the, the advantages and strengths we have in our unique personalities, but at the same time, depending on the Lord to making sure that he covers our blind spots and learning that, that, hey, there's always an answer and we need to make sure that we surrender to him, that we find ourselves at his feet and we place him number one. Thank you, uh, uh, Pastor Brooks. And, and just to let you know, Pastor, I in the chat, people have been saying, been telling me, uh, Pastor Wade, you need to bring him back. You, you need to bring Pastor Brooks back. And, and, and because I'm a type two, I'm going to help my people out. Amen. <laughs> and, and, and so we'll, we'll, we'll keep in talks, but we will definitely bring you back, my brother. I, I have to listen to the people of God right now on this one. I'll I, I, I listen to the people of God. But, but no, we, we just thank you. It was great. It was insightful. And it's exactly what it, we need it for, for, for our church um, at, this, at, at this juncture of where we're at. Thank you so much. Well, family, at this time, we're going to go into our season of prayer, our prayer of intercession. And so I'm going to bring on um, one of Campus Stella's finest saints and our prayer coordinator um, and our stewardship director, um, Sister Betty Williams. Um, Sister Williams will lead us out in our intercessory prayer um, at this time. So, Sister William, could you please um, lead us to the throne of grace um, 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 for uh, our power hour? Intercede for those who are in need of special prayer, special prayer. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name we come at the mercy seat. We are so very grateful for the encouragement we have received this evening, Lord, to unravel ourselves and let you do the work in our hearts. We thank you so much for loving us in spite of who we are. We thank you for your grace and mercy that has brought us through this far. And Lord, we pray for all those who have been going through struggles in this time 
we have this COVID that's going around and people's hearts are failing them for fear. But we are asking you, dear God, to help them to be comforted. As David says in the Psalms, what time I'm afraid, I will pray. So Father, we are praying tonight for each one. You know what they are going through. They need you more than anything else. And so we ask in you, Lord, to visit each one, touch their heart, draw them closer to thee, give them hope and courage to continue. Because Lord, we know that it won't be long. It won't be long when you shall come and give your people relief. Remember the children of Israel down in Egypt when they were down there under the hard task master and you sent Moses to deliver them. We know that you'll soon send Jesus Say, son, go get my children. Help us, Lord, to be ready and to stay ready for your second coming. Remember those who have lost their loved ones. Only you know, God, how much pain it gives. But we're asking you, Lord, to comfort them through the Holy Spirit, even now, and the man's family. And uh, the other lady that passed away the other day, we pray for her, Lord, that you continue to be with the family members and strengthen them and guide them and keep them faithful to the end of life journey. Father, we love you and we want to praise you. We're asking you, Lord, to be with the elders and the pastors and loved ones that they be faithful and strengthened to the end of life journey. We know you're soon to come and we are hoping for every one of us to be ready. Bless our youths. We pray for them, oh God, as they go to their struggles in these times. We know it's very lonely, but Lord, comfort them, we pray. Send your Holy Spirit in each heart so we will be comforted. Bless your church and may it continue to strive and to victory because one day soon we shall triumph. Be with us now, we pray. And as we're planning and Sabbath to sit at the table to feast and with you, we're asking you to help us prepare ourselves so that we'll not take it unworthily. Please accept our worship tonight, we pray. And be with the sick and shut in. Lord, be with the caregivers too. Be with Sister Jones, who is in the hospital at this time. And Lord, we ask you to visit her tonight and comfort her heart. Make her bed in her affliction as you promised to do. Be with the other elderly who are home, homebound, and the so many nursing home. We pray for them that you, God, will take care of them. Lord, we know that this problem we are going through, it only you can help. No one else. We can try, we can try, but God is the answer. Lord, we just want to say thank you so much for listening to our prayer tonight and thank you so much for answering. Now, Father, give us a good, peaceful night rest and we ask all these mercies in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Sister Williams, for that powerful, powerful prayer. And church family, let's continue to keep each other in prayer, especially those who have experienced loss and those who are sick and shut in. Once again, my brother, uh, my friend, my pastor, uh, thank you so much for, for just sharing with us, for allowing God to use you. And, and, and we will definitely uh, make sure that you come back, you come back. And, and so uh, uh, just, 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 it's just great to have you and the saints are very appreciative. Now, uh, people of God, um, as we close, just once again, want to remind you all of the service memorial service for Elder Michael Manns on tomorrow. Um, of course, um, in-person attendance is limited to family and, 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 and invited um, friends and guests, um, and, but, but all are welcome to view via live stream uh, in order for, to support and encourage the family. And that live stream will be on both our Facebook um, page, our YouTube channel, and there will be a link also available on our church's website, on our church's website. If you were blessed by what you uh, um, heard this evening, this evening, and if you want to have continual prayer, please click the link in the description for special prayer. Um, just click in the link and, and we want to connect with you and want to continue to pray for you. Um, also, we have our uh, a communion service this Sabbath, April 3rd. We're gonna have a wonderful and awesome time in celebrating um, um, our God, our risen Savior, through the ordinance of humility and through the Lord's Supper. So make sure you are there. Invite your friends. Invite your friends to this celebration because we just want everyone to know that it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sins, that we serve a risen Savior, 
but not only has he risen, but he is returning. Can you say amen? He's coming back one day. Lo, he comes. He comes all glorious. See, 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 Pastor Brooks, see what you made me do? You, you got me excited. I want to preach, but I ain't going to do that to the people of God. I got Sabbath. I got Sabbath. So once again, we thank you all. Blessings upon you all. And remember that God loves you, that, that be confident in who he made you to be. Rely on him. Give grace to others and continue to live for Jesus. May God bless you and take care and we'll see you this Sabbath.